In Lars Onsager's 1949 paper titled Statistical Hydrodynamics, he described two-dimensional turbulence using ideas from thermodynamics, assigning a temperature to distributions of vortices. So a system of particles has a temperature which corresponds to the average velocity of the particles in it. So if we draw a graph of the velocity of individual particles and how probable it is to have a particle of that velocity, it'll typically look something like this. And the peak of this distribution corresponds to the temperature. We can also talk about temperature in terms of how much entropy increases as we add more energy to a system. So entropy is a measure of how disordered a system is. A perfectly ordered system has no entropy, whereas a perfectly disordered or completely random system has the highest possible entropy. So typically, as we add energy to a system, its entropy is going to increase. And it's the gradient of this entropy with respect to energy graph that forms the definition of temperature. So temperature is inversely proportional to the gradient of this graph. So sometimes we refer to this inverse temperature by the Greek letter beta times Boltzmann's constant. So in Lars Onsager's description of two-dimensional turbulence, instead of talking about the particles making up the fluid, he talked about the vortices themselves as being the particles to which he assigned a temperature. So the vortices in a superfluid can be thought of as points about which fluid is flowing and can either flow in one direction, which we'll call positive, or flow in the opposite direction, which we'll call negative. Now these velocity fields due to the vortices are going to extend out throughout the fluid. So if I draw a graph of the velocity as a function of the radius from the center of the vortex core, it's going to decrease the further you get away from the vortex, but it's always finite. It never goes to zero unless you have a boundary on your fluid or the flow is cancelled out by a second vortex. And so the flows due to different vortices can either add or subtract to each other to make up the total flow of the fluid that contains them. And so in Onsager's description of vortices, it was the energy of the flow field of the vortices that he considered and the entropy corresponding to the configuration of the vortices or how they were arranged in the fluid. And so if we consider a low energy and low entropy case first, we might have a system of vortices where for every positive vortex, it's paired up with a vortex of the opposite sign. And so because these two vortices are close to each other and the flow fields due to them are in equal strength but opposite direction, they effectively cancel each other out. And so beyond this close region where the vortices are knit close to each other, the net flow field on the fluid is almost zero. And so overall, this is a very low energy state. It's also a very low entropy state because there's quite a bit of order in this system. Each positive vortex is paired up with a minus vortex. And so these vortices aren't randomly distributed. And so as we add more energy into the system, that's going to have to correspond to these vortices and anti-vortices, or vortices that spin in the opposite direction, separating out and not cancelling each other out as perfectly. And so as these vortices separate out, the flow field becomes stronger, but also the arrangement of the vortices starts to become more and more random. And so as well as increasing our energy, we've also increased in entropy. But as Onsager pointed out, if the fluid is confined so that the vortices can only exist in a finite area, then even the most random configuration of vortices isn't going to correspond to the highest possible energy in this flow field. Instead, if the vortices begin to pair up with other vortices of the same sign as themselves, then overall the fluid is going to look as though it has just got two giant vortices rather than lots of individual little ones. As these individual vortices fields add together 
to create larger and larger flow fields. Now, if we consider the entropy of this case, once again, this is a fairly ordered system because the vortices of the same sign are grouped together. And so it's not as random as these other cases, yet it has a higher energy. And so the entropy has gone down while our energy has gone up. And there exists in the system a highest possible energy, which essentially corresponds to these vortices of each sign sitting directly on top of each other and separated out in the fluid. And so there exists a highest possible energy state. Now, if we return to our definition of temperature, which is the gradient of this entropy versus energy graph that I've drawn, then over here for these what we would call dipole states, where each vortex is paired up with an anti-vortex. In this region, if we draw a tangent line on our graph, then that corresponds to one on T, and that is greater than zero. So here we have a positive value of temperature. As we move into these more random configurations, at some point, this gradient is gonna go through zero. And at this point, we have that one on t goes towards zero, or equivalently, t goes towards infinity. And so this most random configuration, we say that the temperature of the system goes towards infinity. As we continue increasing the energy of the system, we come into this region of the phase space where the tangent line on this graph is actually negative, and so one on t is less than zero. And so in this region of space, we have a negative absolute temperature. At the extreme energy, we have negative absolute zero, which is gonna be the highest possible temperature available in this system, as opposed to absolute zero, which is the lowest possible temperature. And so if we add another scale to this, which is temperature, then the temperature is going to go from zero up to infinity. And then as this tangent line here flips from being slightly positive to being slightly negative, all of a sudden there's a break here where the temperature corresponds to negative infinity. And then as it continues heating, that temperature is going to heat up towards negative absolute zero. And so, as I mentioned, sometimes we like to talk about beta instead, because this number line doesn't really make that much sense. It's not very intuitive. We go from zero to infinity to minus infinity to minus zero. Whereas if we were to take negative beta as our measurement, we would go from negative infinity, approach zero from the negative side, cross into positive values, and continue heating until an infinite inverse temperature. And so in our experiments here at Monash University, we've created states resembling these in a, a superfluid known as a Bose-Einstein condensate. And so in Onsager's model, he used these individual quantized vortices to approximate the continuous velocity fields of a regular fluid. In our Bose-Einstein condensates, however, these quantized vortices are not an approximation. Our superfluid can only flow with fixed quanta of circulation. And so this model becomes a very good approximation for what we see. And so by dragging different arrays of laser beams through our condensate, we can generate vortices that are spaced differently, ranging from cases where we have many vortex, anti-vortex dipole pairs, to more random type cases and arrangements where we have more clustered vortices of the same sign than we do um, dipole pairs or random vortices. And so for the first time, we've been able to use Onsager's thermodynamic description of quantized vortices to analyze experimental data where we've got vortex distributions ranging from positive temperatures through to negative temperatures, just as he described.